Cosimo said, Since we are changing the discussion, I would like the questioner to be changed, so that I may not be held to be presumptuous, which I have always censured in others. I therefore resign the speakership, and I surrender it to any of these friends of mine who want it. Zenobi said, It would be most gracious of you to continue, but, since you do not want to, you ought at least to tell us which of us should succeed in your place. Cosimo said, I would like to pass this burden on to the Lord Fabrizio. Fabrizio said, I am content to accept it, and would like to follow the Venetian custom, that the youngest talks first. For this being an exercise for young men, I am persuaded that young men are more adept at reasoning than they are quick to follow. Cosimo said, It falls therefore to you, Luigi, and I am pleased with such a successor, as long as you are satisfied with such a questioner. Fabrizio said, I am certain that, in wanting to show how an army is well organized for undertaking an engagement, it would be necessary to narrate how the Greeks and the Romans arranged the ranks in their armies. Nonetheless, as you yourselves are able to read and consider these things through the medium of ancient writers, I shall omit many particulars, and will cite only those things that appear necessary for me to imitate in the desire, in our times, to give some part of perfection to our army. This will be done, and in time I will show how an army is arranged for an engagement, how it faces a real battle, and how it can be trained in mock ones. The greatest mistake that those men make who arrange an army for an engagement is to give it only one front, and commit it to only one onrush and one attempt or fortune. This results from having lost the method the ancients employed of receiving one rank into the other. For without this method one cannot help the rank in front, or defend them, or change them by rotation in battle, which was practised best by the Romans. In explaining this method, therefore, I want to tell how the Romans divided each legion into three parts, namely the Astarte, the Princeps, and the Triari of whom the Astarte were placed in the first line of the army, in solid and deep ranks, and behind them were the Princeps, but placed with their ranks more open, and behind these they placed the Triari, with ranks so sparse as to be able, if necessary, to receive the Princeps and the Astarte between them. In addition to these they had slingers, bowmen, archers, and other lightly armed, who were not in these ranks, but were situated at the head of the army between the cavalry and the infantry. These light-armed men, therefore, enkindled the battle, and if they won, which rarely happened, they pursued the victory. If they were repulsed, they retired by way of the flanks of the army, or into the intervals and gaps provided for such a result, and were led back among those who were not armed. After this proceeding, the Astarte came hand to hand with the enemy, and who, if they saw themselves being overcome, retired, little by little, through the open spaces in the ranks of the Princeps, and together with them renewed the fight. If these also were forced back, they all retired into the thin lines of the Triari, and all together, en masse, recommenced the battle. And if these were defeated, there was no other remedy, as there was no way left to reform themselves. The cavalry were on the flanks of the army, placed like two wings on a body and they sometimes fought on horseback, and sometimes helped the infantry, according as the need required. This method of reforming themselves three times is almost impossible to surpass, as it is necessary that fortune abandon you three times, and that the enemy has so much virtue that he overcomes you three times. The Greeks, with their phalanxes, did not have this method of reforming themselves, and although these had many ranks and leaders within them, nonetheless, they constituted one body, or rather one front, so that in order to help one another they did not retire from one rank into the other, as the Romans, but one man took the place of another, which they did in this way. Their phalanxes were made up of ranks, and supposing they had placed fifty men per rank, when their front came up against the enemy, only the first six ranks of all of them were able to fight, because their lances, which they called sarissi, were so long that the point of the lances of those in the sixth rank reached past the front rank. 
When they fought, therefore, if any of the first rank fell, either killed or wounded, whoever was behind him in the second rank immediately entered into his place, and whoever was behind him in the third rank immediately entered into the place of the second rank, which became vacant, and thus successively all at once the ranks behind restored the deficiencies of those in front, so that the ranks were always remained complete, and no position of the combatants was vacant except in the last rank, which became depleted because there was no one in its rear to restore it, so that the injuries which the first rank suffered depleted the last, and the first rank always remained complete. And thus the phalanxes, because of this arrangement, were able rather to become depleted than broken, since the large size of its body made it more immobile. The Romans, in the beginning, also employed phalanxes, and it struck their legions in a way similar to theirs. Afterwards they were not satisfied with this arrangement, and divided the legion into several bodies, that is, into cohorts and maniples. For they judged, as was said a little while ago, that that body should have more life in it, be more active, which should have more spirit, and that it should be composed of several parts, and each regulate itself. The battalions of the Swiss, in these times, employed all the methods of the phalanxes, as much in the size and entirety of their organization, as in the method of helping one another. And when coming to an engagement, they placed the battalions one on the flank of the other, or they placed them one behind the other. They have no way in which the first rank, if it should retire, to be received by the second, but with this arrangement, in order to help one another, they place one battalion in front, and another behind it, to the right, so that if the first has need of aid, the latter can go forward and succour it. They put a third battalion behind these, but distant a gunshot. This they do, because if the other two are repulsed, this third one can make its way forward, and the others have room in which to retire, and avoid the onrush of the one which is going forward. For a large multitude cannot be received in the same way as a small body, and therefore the small and separate bodies that existed in a Roman legion could be so placed together as to be able to receive one another among themselves, and help each other easily. And that this arrangement of the Swiss is not as good as that of the ancient Romans, is demonstrated by the many examples of the Roman legions when they engaged in battle with the Greek phalanxes, and the latter were always destroyed by the former, because the kinds of arms, as I mentioned before, and this method of reforming themselves was not able to maintain the solidity of the phalanx. With these examples, therefore, if I had to organise an army, I would prefer to retain the arms and the methods partly of the Greek phalanxes, partly of the Roman legions and therefore I have mentioned wanting in a battalion two thousand pikes, which are the arms of the Macedonian phalanxes, and three thousand swords and shield, which are the arms of the Romans. I have divided the battalion into ten companies, as the Romans divided the legion into ten cohorts. I have organised the viliti, that is, the light-armed, to enkindle the battle, as they, the Romans, did. And thus, as the arms are mixed, being shared by both nations, and as also the organisations are shared, I have arranged that each company have five ranks of pikes in front, and the remainder swordsmen with shields, in order to be able with this front to resist the cavalry and easily penetrate the enemy companies on foot, and the enemy at first encounter would meet the pikes, which I would hope would suffice to resist him, and then the swordsmen would defeat him. And if you would note the virtue of this arrangement, you will see all these arms will execute their office completely. First, because pikes are useful against cavalry, and when they come against infantry, they do their duty well before the battle closes in, for when they are pressed, they become useless. Whence the Swiss, to avoid this disadvantage, after every three ranks of pikemen, place one of halberds, which, while it is not enough, gives the pikemen room to manoeuvre. Placing, therefore, our pikes in the front, and the shields and swordsmen behind, they manage to resist the cavalry, and, in enkindling the battle, lay open and attack the infantry. But when the battle closes in, and they become useless, the shields and swords take their place, who are able to take care of themselves in every strait. 
Luigi said, We now await with desire to learn how you would arrange an army for battle with these arms and with these organizations. Fabrizio said, I do not want to show you anything else other than this. You have to understand that in a regular Roman army, which they called a consular army, there were not more than two legions of Roman citizens, which consist of six hundred cavalrymen, about eleven thousand infantry. They also had as many more infantry and cavalry, which were sent to them by their friends and confederates, which they divided into two parts, and they called one the right wing, and the other the left wing and they never permitted these latter infantry to exceed the number of infantry of the legion. They were well content that the cavalry should be greater in number. With this army, which consisted of twenty-two thousand infantry and about two thousand cavalry effectives, a consul undertook every action and went on every enterprise. And when it was necessary to face a large force, they brought together two consuls with two armies. You ought also to note that ordinarily in all three of the principal activities in which armies engage, that is, marching, camping, and fighting, they placed the legion in the middle, because they wanted that virtue in which they should trust most should be a greater unity, as the discussion of all these activities will show you. Those auxiliary infantry, because of the training they had with the infantry of the legion, were as effective as the latter as they were disciplined as they were, and therefore they arranged them in a similar way when organising for an engagement. Whoever, therefore, knows how they deployed the entire army? Therefore, having told you how they divided a legion into three lines, and how one line would receive the others, I have come to tell you how the entire army was organised for an engagement. If I would want, therefore, to arrange an army for an engagement in imitation of the Romans, just as they had two legions, I would take two battalions. And these having been deployed, the disposition of an entire army would be known, for by adding more people nothing else is accomplished than to enlarge the organization. I do not believe it is necessary that I remind you how many infantry there are in a battalion, and that it has ten companies, and what leaders there are per company, and what arms they have and who were the ordinary or regular pikemen and veliti, and who the extraordinary, because a little while ago I distinctly told you, and I reminded you to commit it to memory as something necessary if you want to understand all the other arrangements. And, therefore, I will come to the demonstration of the arrangement, without repeating these again. And it appears to me that ten companies of a battalion should be placed on the left flank, and the ten others on the right. Those on the left should be arranged in this way. The five companies should be placed one alongside the other on the front, so that between one and the next there should be a space of four arm lengths, which come to occupy an area of one hundred and forty arm lengths long and forty wide. Behind these five companies I would place three others, distant in a straight line from the first ones by forty arm lengths two of which should come behind in a straight line at the ends of the five, and the other should occupy the space in the middle. Thus these three would come to occupy in length and width the same space as the five, but where the five would have a distance of four arm lengths between one another, this one would have thirty-three. Behind these I would place the last two companies, also in a straight line behind the three, and distant from those three forty arm lengths and I would place each of them behind the ends of the three, so that the space between them would be ninety-one arm lengths. All of these companies arranged thusly would therefore cover an area of one hundred and forty-one arm lengths long and two hundred wide. The extraordinary pikemen I would extend along the flanks of these companies on the left side, distant twenty arm lengths from it, creating a hundred and forty-three files of seven per file so that they should uncover the entire length of the ten companies arranged as I have previously described. And there would remain forty files for protecting the wagons and the unarmed people in the tail of the army, and assigning the heads of ten and the centurions in their proper places. And of the three constables I would put one at the head, another in the middle, and the third in the last file, 
who should fill the office of Tergidatori, as the ancients called the one placed in the charge of the rear of the army. But, returning to the head or van of the army, I say that I would place the extraordinary Veliti alongside the extraordinary pikemen, which, as you know, are five hundred, and would place them at a distance of forty arm lengths. On the side of these, also on the left hand, I would place the men-at-arms, and would assign them a distance of a hundred and fifty arm lengths away. Behind these, the light cavalry, to whom I would assign the same space as the men-at-arms. The ordinary Veliti I would leave around their companies, who would occupy those spaces which I placed between one company and another, and would act to minister to those companies, unless I had already placed them under the extraordinary pikemen, which I would do or not do according as it should benefit my plans. The general head of all the battalions I would place in that space that exists between the first and second order of companies, or rather at the head and in that space which exists between the last of the first five companies and the extraordinary pikemen, according as it should benefit my plans, surrounded by thirty or sixty picked men, and who should know how to execute a commission prudently and stalwartly resist an attack, and should also be in the middle of the buglers and flag-carriers. This is the order in which I would deploy a battalion on the left side, which would be the deployment of half the army, and would cover an area five hundred and eleven arm lengths long, and as much as mentioned above in width, not including the space which that part of the extraordinary pikemen should occupy, who act as a shield for the unarmed men, which would be about one hundred arm lengths. The other battalions I would deploy on the right side, exactly in the same way as I deployed those on the left, having a space of thirty arm lengths between one battalion and the other, in the head of which space I would place some artillery pieces behind which would be the captain-general of the entire army, who should have around him, in addition to the buglers and flag-carriers, at least two hundred picked men, the greater portion on foot, among whom should be ten or more adept at executing every command, and should be so provided with arms and a horse as to be able to go on horseback or afoot, as the need requires. Ten cannon of the artillery of the army suffice for the reduction of towns, which should not exceed fifty pounds per charge, of which, in the field, I would employ more in the defence of the encampment than in waging a battle, and the other artillery should all be rather often than fifteen pounds of charge. This I would place in front of the entire army, unless the country should be such that I could situate it on the flank in a safe place, where it should not be able to be attacked by the enemy. This formation of the army, thusly arranged, in combat can maintain the order both of the phalanxes and of the Roman legions, because the pikemen are in front, and all the infantry so arranged in ranks that, coming to battle with the enemy, and resisting him, they should be able to reform the first ranks from those behind, according to the usage of the phalanxes. On the other hand, if they are attacked so that they are compelled to break ranks and retire, they can enter into the space of the second company behind them, and uniting with them, and en masse be able to resist the combat of the enemy again. And if this should not be enough, they can in the same way retire a second time, and combat a third time, so that in this arrangement, as to combating, they can reform according to both the Greek method and the Roman. As to the strength of the army, it cannot be arranged any stronger, for both wings are amply provided with both leaders and arms, and no part is left weak except that part behind which is unarmed, and even that part has its flanks protected by the extraordinary pikemen. Nor can the enemy assault it in any part where he will not find them organised, and the part in the back cannot be assaulted because there cannot be an enemy who has so much power that he can assail every side equally. For if there is one, you don't have to take the field with him. But if he should be a third greater than you, and as well organised as you, if he weakens himself by assaulting you in several places, as soon as you defeat one part, all will go badly for him. If his cavalry should be greater than yours, be most assured, for the ranks of pikemen that gird you will defend you from every onrush of theirs, even if your cavalry should be repulsed. In addition to this, the heads are placed on the side, 
so that they are able easily to command and obey. And the spaces that exist between one company and the next one, and between one rank and the next, not only serve to enable one to receive the other, but also to provide a place for the messengers who go and come by order of the captain. And as I told you before, as the Romans had about twenty thousand men in an army, so too ought this one to have. And as other soldiers borrowed their mode of fighting and the formation of their army from the legions, so too those soldiers that you assembled into your two battalions would have to borrow their formations and organization. Having given example of these things, it is an easy matter to imitate it, for if the army is increased either by two battalions, or by as many men as are contained in them, nothing else has to be done than to double the arrangements. And where ten companies are placed on the left side, twenty are now placed, either by increasing or extending the ranks, according as the place or the enemy should command you. Luigi said, Truly, my lord, I have so imagined this army that I see it now, and have a desire to see it facing us, and not for anything in the world would I desire you to become Fabius Maximus, having thoughts of holding the enemy at bay and delaying the engagement, for I would say worse of you than the Roman people said of him. Fabrizio said, Do not be apprehensive. Do you not hear the artillery? Ours has already fired, but harmed the enemy little. And the extraordinary Veliti come forth from their places, together with the light cavalry, and spread out, and with as much fury and the loudest shouts of which they are capable, assault the enemy, whose artillery has fired one time, and has passed over the heads of our infantry, without doing them any injury. And as it is not able to fire a second time, our Veliti and cavalry has already seized it, and to defend it the enemy has moved forward, so that neither that of friend or enemy can perform its office. You see with what virtue our men fight and with what discipline they have become accustomed, because of the training they have had, and from the confidence they have in the army, which you see with their stride. And with the men-at-arms alongside, in marching order, going to rekindle the battle with the adversary, you see our artillery, which to make place for them, and to leave the space free, has retired to the place from which the Veliti went forth. You see the captain, who encourages them, and points out to them certain victory, you see the Veliti and light cavalry have spread out and returned to the flanks of the army, in order to see if they can cause any injury to the enemy on the flanks. Look, the armies are facing each other. Watch with what virtue they have withstood the onrush of the enemy, and with what silence, and how the captain commands the men-at-arms that they should resist and not attack, and do not detach themselves from the ranks of the infantry. You see how our light cavalry has gone to attack a band of enemy gunners who wanted to attack by the flank, and how the enemy cavalry have succoured them, so that, caught between the cavalry of the one and the other, they cannot fire, and retire behind their companies. You see with what fury our pikemen attack them, and how the infantry is already so near each other that they can no longer manage their pikes, so that according to the discipline taught by us, our pikemen retire little by little among the shields. Watch how, in this encounter, so great an enemy band of men-at-arms has pushed back our men-at-arms on the left side, and how ours, according to discipline, have retired under the extraordinary pikemen, and having reformed the front with their aid, have repulsed the adversary, and killed a good part of them. In fact, all the ordinary pikemen of the first company have hidden themselves among the ranks of the shields, and having left the battle to the swordsmen, who look with what virtue, security, and leisure kill the enemy. Do you not see that, when fighting, the ranks are so straitened that they can handle the swords only with much effort? Look with what hurry the enemy moves, for armed with the pike and their swords useless, the one because it is too long, the other because of finding the enemy too greatly armed. In part they fall dead or wounded, in part they flee. See them flee on the right side, they also flee on the left. Look, the victory is ours. Have we not won an engagement very happily? But it would have been won with greater felicity if I should have been allowed to put them in action. And see that it was not necessary to avail ourselves of either the second or third ranks, that our first line was sufficient to overcome them. In this part I have nothing else to tell you, except to dissolve any doubt that should arise in you. Luigi said, you have won this engagement with so much fury that I am astonished, 
and in fact so stupefied that I do not believe I can well explain if there is any doubt left in my mind. Yet, trusting in your prudence, I will take courage to say that I intend. Tell me first, why did you not let your artillery fire more than one time? And why did you have them quickly retire within the army, not afterward make any other mention of them? It seems to me also that you pointed the enemy artillery high, and arranged it so that it should be of much benefit to you. Yet if it should occur, and I believe it happens often, that the lines are pierced, what remedy do you provide? And since I have commenced on artillery, I want to bring up all these questions, so as not to have to discuss it any more. I have heard many disparage the arms and the organization of the ancient armies, arguing that today they could do little, or rather how useless they would be against the fury of artillery, for these are superior to their arms, and break the ranks, so that it appears to them to be madness to create an arrangement that cannot be held, and to endure hardship in carrying a weapon that cannot defend you. Fabrizio said, This question of yours has need, because it has so many items, of a long answer. It is true that I did not have the artillery fire more than one time, and because of it one remains in doubt. The reason is that it is more important to one to guard against being shot than shooting the enemy. You must understand that, if you do not want the artillery to injure you, it is necessary to stay where it cannot reach you, or to put yourself behind a wall or embankment. Nothing else will stop it, but it is necessary for them to be very strong. Those captains who must make an engagement cannot remain behind walls or embankments, nor can they remain where it may reach them. They must, therefore, since they do not have a way of protecting themselves, find one by which they are injured less. Nor can they do anything other than to undertake it quickly. The way of doing this is to find it quickly and directly, not slowly or en masse. The speed does not allow them to shoot again, and because the men are scattered, they can injure only a few of them. A band of organized men cannot do this, because if they march in a straight line, they become disorganized. And if they scatter, they do not give the enemy the hard work to rout them, for they have routed themselves. And therefore I would organize the army so that it should be able to do both, for having placed a thousand veliti in its wings, I would arrange that, after our artillery has fired, they should issue forth together with the light cavalry to seize the enemy artillery. And therefore I did not have my artillery fire again, so as not to give the enemy time, for you cannot give me time and take it from others. And for that the reason I did not have it fire a second time was not to allow it to be fired first, because to render the enemy artillery useless there is no other remedy than to assault it, which, if the enemy abandons it, you seize it. If they want to defend it, it is necessary that they leave it behind, so that in the hands of the enemy or of friends it cannot be fired. I believe that, even without examples, this discussion should be enough for you. Yet, being able to give you some from the ancients, I will do so. Ventidius, coming to battle with the Parthians, the virtue of whom, in great part, consisted in their bows and darts, he allowed them to come almost under his encampment before he led the army out, which he only did in order to be able to seize them quickly, and not give them time to fire. Caesar, in Gaul, tells that in coming to battle with the enemy, he was assaulted by them with such fury that his men did not have time to draw their darts, according to the Roman customs. It is seen, therefore, that being in the field, if you do not want something fired from a distance to injure you, there is no other remedy than to be able to seize it as quickly as possible. Another reason also caused me to do without firing the artillery, at which you may perhaps laugh, yet I do not judge it to be disparaged. There is nothing that causes greater confusion in an army than to obstruct its vision, whence most stalwart armies have been routed for having their vision obstructed, either by dust or by the sun. There is also nothing that impedes the vision more than the smoke which the artillery makes when fired. I would think, therefore, that it would be more prudent to let the enemy blind himself than for you to go blindly to find him. I would, therefore, not fire, or, as this would not be approved because of the reputation the artillery has, I would put it on the wings of the army, 
so that firing it, its smoke should not blind the front of what is most important of our forces. And that obstructing the vision of the enemy is something useful can be adduced from the example of Epaminondas, who, to blind the enemy army which was coming to engage him, had his light cavalry run in front of the enemy, so that they raised the dust high, which obstructed their vision, and gave him the victory in the engagement. As to it appearing to you that I aimed the shots of the artillery in my own manner, making it pass over the heads of the infantry, I reply that there are more times, and without comparison, that the heavy artillery does not penetrate the infantry than it does, because the infantry lies so low, and the artillery is so difficult to fire, that any little that you raise them causes them to pass over the heads of the infantry, and if you lower them, they damage the ground, and the shot does not reach the infantry. Also the unevenness of the ground saves them, for every little mound or height which exists between the infantry and the artillery impedes it. And as to cavalry, and especially men-at-arms, because they are taller and can more easily be hit, they can be kept in the rear of the army until the time the artillery has fired. It is true that often they injure the smaller artillery and the gunners more than the latter, to which the best remedy is to come quickly to grips. And if in the first assault some are killed, as some always do die, a good captain and a good army do not have to fear an injury that is confined, but a general one. And to imitate the Swiss, who never shun an engagement, even if terrified by artillery, rather they punish with the capital penalty those who, because of fear of it, either break ranks or by their person give the sign of fear. I made them, once it had been fired, to retire into the army, because it left the passage free to the companies. No other mention of it was made, as something useless once the battle has started. You have also said, in regard to the fury of this instrument, that many judge the arms and the systems of the ancients to be useless. And it appears from your talk that the moderns have found an army and systems which are useful against the artillery. If you know this, I would be pleased for you to show it to me, for up to now I do not know of any that has been observed nor do I believe any can be found. So I would like to learn from those men for what reasons the soldiers on foot of our times wear the breastplate or the corslet of iron, and those on horseback go completely covered with armour, since condemning the ancient armour as useless, with respect to the artillery, they ought also to shun these. I would also like to learn for what reason the Swiss, in imitation of the ancient systems, form a close company of six or eight thousand infantry, and for what reason all the others have imitated them, bringing the same dangers to this system because of the artillery as the others brought which had been imitated from antiquity. I believe that they would not know what to answer, but if you ask the soldiers, who should have some experience, they would answer, first, that they go armed, because even if that armour does not protect them from the artillery, it does every other injury inflicted by an enemy, and they would also answer that they go closely together, as the Swiss, in order to be better able to attack the infantry, resist the cavalry, and give the enemy more difficulty in routing them. So that it is observed that soldiers have to fear many other things beside the artillery, from which they defend themselves with armour and organisation. From which it follows that, as much as an army is better armed, and as much as its ranks are more serrated and more powerful, so much more is it secure. So that whoever is of the opinion you mentioned must be either of little prudence, or has thought very little on this matter. For if we see the least part of an ancient way of arming in use to-day, which is the pike, and the least part of those systems which are the battalions of the Swiss, which do us so much good, and lend so much power to our armies, why shouldn't we believe that the other arms and other systems that they left us are also useful? Moreover, if we do not have any regard for the artillery when we place ourselves close together, like the Swiss, what other system than that can make us afraid? Inasmuch as there is no other arrangement that can make us afraid than that of being pressed together. In addition to this, if the enemy artillery does not frighten me when I lay siege to a town, 
where he may injure me with great safety to himself, and where I am enabled to capture it, as it is defended from the walls, but can stop him only with time with my artillery, so that he is able to redouble his shots as he wishes, or why do I have to be afraid of him in the field, where I am able to seize him quickly? Uh, so I conclude this, that the artillery, according to my opinion, does not impede any one who is able to use the methods of the ancients, and demonstrate the ancient virtue. And if I had not talked another time with you concerning this instrument, I would extend myself further. But I want to return to what I have now said. Luigi said, We are able to have a very good understanding, since you have so much discoursed about artillery, and in some it seems to me that you have shown that the best remedy one has against it, when he is in the field and having an army in an encounter, is to capture it quickly. Upon which a doubt rises in me, for it seems to me the enemy can so locate it on the side of his army, from which he can injure you, and would be so protected by the other sides, that it cannot be captured. You have, if you will remember, in your army's order for battle, created intervals of four arm lengths between one company and the next, and placed twenty of the extraordinary pikemen of the company there. If the enemy should organise his army similarly to yours, and place his artillery well within those intervals, I believe that from here he would be able to injure you with the greatest safety to himself, for it would not be possible to enter among the enemy forces to capture it. Fabrizio said, uh, You doubt very prudently, and I will endeavour either to resolve the doubt, or give you a remedy. I have told you that these companies, either when going out or when fighting, are continually in motion, and by nature always end up close together, so that if you make the intervals small, in which you would place the artillery, in a short time they would be so closed up that the artillery can no longer perform its function. If you make them large, to avoid this danger, you incur a greater, so that, because of those intervals, you not only give the enemy the opportunity to capture your artillery, but to rout you. But you have to know that it is impossible to keep the artillery between the ranks, especially those that are mounted on carriages, for the artillery travel in one direction, and are fired in the other. So that if they are desired to be fired while travelling, it is necessary before they are fired that they be turned, and when they are being turned they need so much space that fifty carriages of artillery would disrupt every army. It is necessary, therefore, to keep them outside the ranks, where they can be operated in the manner which we showed you a short time ago. But let us suppose they can be kept there, and that a middle way can be found, and of a kind which, when closed together, should not impede the artillery, yet not be so open as to provide a path for the enemy. I see that this is easily remedied at the time of the encounter, by creating intervals in your army which give a free path for its shots and thus its fury will be useless, which can be easily done, because the enemy, if it wants its artillery to be safe, must place it at the end position of the intervals, so that its shots, if they should not harm its own men, must pass in a straight line, and always in the same line, and therefore by giving them room, can easily be avoided. Because this is a general rule, that you must give way to those things which cannot be resisted, as the ancients did to the elephants and chariots with sickles. I believe, or rather, I am more than certain, that it must appear to you that I prepared and won an engagement in my own manner. Nonetheless, I will repeat this, if what I have said up to now is not enough, that it would be impossible for an army thus organised and armed not to overcome, at the first encounter, every other army organised as modern armies are organised which often, unless they have shields or swordsmen, do not form a front, and are of an unarmed kind, which cannot defend themselves from a nearby enemy, and so organised that, if they place their companies on the flanks next to each other, not having a way of receiving one another, they cause it to be confused, and apt to be easily disturbed. And although they give their armies three names, and divide them into three ranks, the vanguard, the company or main body, and the rear guard, nonetheless 
they do not serve for anything else than to distinguish them in marching and in their quarters. But in an engagement, they are all pledged to the first attack and fortune. And Luigi said, I have also noted that in making your engagement, your cavalry was repulsed by the enemy cavalry, and that it retired among the extraordinary pikemen. Whence it happened that with their aid they withstood and repulsed the enemy in the rear. I believe the pikemen can withstand the cavalry, as you said, but not a large and strong battalion, as the Swiss do, which in your army have five ranks of pikemen at the head, and seven on the flank, so that I do not know how they are able to withstand them. Fabrizio said, Although I have told you that six ranks were employed in the phalanxes of Macedonia at one time, none the less you have to know that a Swiss battalion, if it were composed of a thousand ranks, could not employ but four, or at most five, because the pikes are nine arm lengths long, and an arm length and a half is occupied by the hands, whence only seven and a half arm lengths of the pike remain to the first rank. And the second rank, in addition to what the hand occupies, uses up an arm length of the space that exists between one rank and the next, so that not even six arm lengths of pike remain of use. For the same reasons there remain four and one half arm lengths to the third rank, three to the fourth, and one and a half to the fifth. The other ranks are useless to inflict injury, but they serve to replace the first ranks, as we have said, and serve as reinforcements for those first five ranks. If, therefore, five of their ranks can control cavalry, why cannot five of ours control them, to whom five ranks behind them are also not lacking to sustain them? and give the same support, even though they do not have pikes as the others do. And if the ranks of extraordinary pikemen, which are placed along the flanks, seem thin to you, they can be formed into a square, and placed by the flank of the two companies which I place in the last ranks of the army, from which place they would all together be able easily to help the van and the rear of the army, and lend aid to the cavalry, according as their need may require. Luigi said, would you always use this form of organization when you would want to engage in battle? Fabrizio said, Not in every case, for you have to vary the formation of the army according to the fitness of the site, the kind and numbers of the enemy, which will be shown before this discussion is furnished with an example. But the formation that is given here, not so much because it is stronger than others, which is in truth very strong, as much because from it is obtained a rule and a system, to know how to recognize the manner of organization of the others. For every science has its generations, upon which in good part it is based. One thing only I would remind you, that you never organize an army so that whoever fights in the van cannot be helped by those situated behind, because whoever makes this error renders useless the great part of the army and if any virtue is eliminated, he cannot win. Luigi said, And on this part some doubt has arisen in me. I have seen that in the disposition of the companies you form the front with five on each side, the centre with three, and the rear with two, and I would believe that it should be better to arrange them oppositely, because I think that an army can be routed with more difficulty, for whoever should attack it the more he should penetrate into it, so much harder would he find it. But the arrangement made by you appears to me results that the more one enters into it, the more he finds it weak. Fabrizio said, If you would remember that the Triari, who were the third rank of the Roman legions, were not assigned more than six hundred men, you would have less doubt, when you leave that they were placed in the last ranks, because you will see that I, motivated by this example, have placed two companies in the last ranks, which comprise nine hundred infantry, so that I come to err rather with the Roman people in having taken away too many than few. And although this example should suffice, I want to tell you the reasons, which is this. The first line of the army is made solid and dense, because it has to withstand the attack of the enemy and does not have to receive any friends into it. And because of this, it must abound in men, for few men would make it weak both from their sparseness and their numbers. But the second line, because it has to receive the friends from the first line who have withstood the enemy, 
must have large intervals, and therefore must have a smaller number than the first. For if it should be of a greater or equal number, it would result in not leaving any intervals, which would cause disorder. Or if some should be left, it would extend beyond the ends of those in front, which would make the formation of the army imperfect. And what do you say is not true, that the more the enemy enters into the battalions, the weaker he will find them? For the enemy can never fight with the second line if the first one is not joined up with it, so that he will come to find the centre of the battalion stronger and not weaker, having to fight with the first and second lines together. The same thing happens if the enemy should reach the third line, because here he will not only have to fight with two fresh companies, but with the entire battalion. And as this last part has to receive more men, its spaces must be larger, and those who receive them lesser in number. Luigi said, And I like what you have said, but also answer me this. If the five companies retire among the second three, and afterwards the eight among the third two, it does not seem possible that the eight come together and the ten together, and are able to crowd together, whether they are eight or ten, into the same space which the five occupied. Fabrizio said, The first thing that I answer is that it is not the same space, for the five have four spaces between them, which they occupy when retiring between one battalion and the next, and that which exists between the three or the two. There also remains that space which exists between the companies and the extraordinary pikemen, which spaces are all made large. There is added to this whatever other space the companies have when they are in the lines without being changed, for when they are changed the ranks are either compressed or enlarged. They become enlarged when they are so very much afraid that they put themselves in flight. They are compressed when they become so afraid that they seek to save themselves not by flight but by defence, so that in this case they would compress themselves and not spread out. There is added to this that the five ranks of pikemen who are in front, once they have started the battle, have to retire among their companies in the rear of the army to make space for the shield-bearers who are able to fight. And when they go into the rear of the army, they can serve whoever the captain should judge should employ them well, whereas in the front, once the fight becomes mixed, they would be completely useless. And therefore the arranged spaces come to be very capacious for the remaining forces. But even if these spaces should not suffice, the flanks on the side consist of men and not walls who, when they give way and spread out, are able to create a space of such capacity which should be sufficient to receive them. Luigi said, The ranks of the extraordinary pikemen, which you place on the flank of the army, when the first company retires into the second, do you want them to remain firm and become as two wings of the army, or do you also want them to retire with the company? Which, if they have to do this, I do not see how they can as they do not have companies behind them with wide intervals which would receive them. Fabrizio said, If the enemy does not fight them when he forces the companies to retire, they are able to remain firm in their ranks, and inflict injury on the enemy on the flank, since the first companies had retired. But if they should also fight them, as seems reasonable, being so powerful as to be able to force the others to retire, they should cause them also to retire which they are very well able to do, even though they have no one behind who should receive them, for from the middle forward they are able to double on the right, one file entering into the other, in the manner we discussed when we talked of the arrangement for doubling themselves. It is true that when doubling they should want to retire behind, other means must be found than that which I have shown you, since I told you that the second rank has to enter among the first, the fourth among the third, and so on little by little, and in this case it would not be begun from the front, but from the rear, so that doubling the ranks they should come to retire to the rear, and not to turn in front. But to reply to all of that which you have asked concerning this engagement as shown by me, it should be repeated, and I again say that I have organised this army, and will again explain this engagement to you, for two reasons. One, 
to show you how the army is organized, the other to show you how it is trained. As to the systems, I believe you all most knowledgeable. As to the army, I tell you that it may often be put together in this form, for the heads are taught to keep their companies in this order. And because it is the duty of each individual soldier to keep well the arrangement of each company, and it is the duty of each head to keep well those in each part of the army, and to know well how to obey the commands of the general captain. They must know, therefore, how to join one company with another, and how to take their places instantly. And therefore the banner of each company must have its number displayed openly, so that they may be commanded, and the captain and the soldiers will more readily recognize that number. The battalions ought also to be numbered, and have their number on their principal banner. One must know, therefore, what the number is of the battalion placed on the left or right wing, the number of those placed in the front and the centre, and so on for the others. I would want also that these numbers reflect the grades of positions in the army. For instance, the first grade is the head of ten, the second is the head of fifty ordinary veliti, the third the centurion, the fourth the head of the first company, the fifth that of the second company, the sixth of the third, and so on, up to the tenth company, which should be in the second place next to the general captain of the battalion. Nor should anyone arrive to that leadership unless he first has risen through all these grades. And, as in addition to these heads, there are the three constables in command of the extraordinary pikemen, and the two of the extraordinary veliti. I would want them to be of the grade of constable of the first company. Nor would I care if they were men of equal grade, as long as each of them should vie to be promoted to the second company. Each one of these captains, therefore, knowing where his company should be located, of necessity it will follow that, at the sound of the trumpet, once the captain's flag was raised, all of the army would be in its proper places. And this is the first exercise to which an army ought to become accustomed that is, to assemble itself quickly. And to do this you must frequently, each day, arrange them and disarrange them. Luigi said, What signs would you want the flags of the army to have, in addition to the number? Fabrizio said, I would want the one of the general captain to have the emblem of the army. All the others should also have the same emblem, but varying with the fields or with the sign, as it should seem best to the lord of the army but this matters little so long as their effect results in their recognizing one another. But let us pass on to another exercise in which an army ought to be trained, which is to set it in motion, to march with a convenient step, and to see that, while in motion, it maintains order. The third exercise is that they be taught to conduct themselves as they would afterwards in an engagement, to fire the artillery and retire it, to have the extraordinary veliti issue forth, and after a mock assault, have them retire. Have the first company, as if they were being pressed, retire within the intervals of the second company, and then both into the third, and from here each one to return to its place, and to so accustom them in this exercise that it becomes understood and familiar to every one, which with practice and familiarity will readily be learned. The fourth exercise is that they be taught to recognize the commands of the captain by virtue of his bugle calls and flags, as they will understand without other command the pronouncements made by voice. And as the importance of the commands depends on the bugle calls, I will tell you what sounds or calls the ancients used. According as Thucydides confirms, whistles were often used in the army of the Lacedaemonians, for they judged that its pitch was more apt to make their army proceed with seriousness and not with fury. Motivated by the same reason, the Carthaginians, in their first assault, used the zither. Aliatus, king of the Lydians, used the zither and whistles in war. But Alexander the Great and the Romans used horns and trumpets, like those who thought the courage of the soldiers could be increased by virtue of such instruments, and caused them to combat more bravely. But just as we have borrowed from the Greek and Roman methods in equipping our army, so also in choosing sounds should we serve ourselves of the customs of both those nations. 
I would, therefore, place the trumpets next to the general captain, as their sound is apt not only to inflame the army, but to be heard over every noise more than any other sound. I would want that the other sounds existing around the constables and heads of companies to be made by small drums and whistles, sounded not as they are presently, but as they are customarily sounded at banquets. I would want, therefore, for the captain to use the trumpets in indicating when they should stop, or go forward, or turn back, when they should fire the artillery, when to move the extraordinary veliti, and by changes in these sounds or calls, point out to the army all those moves that generally are pointed out, and those trumpets afterwards followed by drums. And as training in these matters are of great importance, I would follow them very much in training your army. As to the cavalry, I would want to use the same trumpets, but of lower volume and different pitch of sounds from those of the captain. This is all that occurs to me concerning the organization and training of the army. Luigi said, I beg you not to be so serious in clearing up another matter for me. Why did you have the light cavalry and the extraordinary veliti move with shouts and noise and fury when they attacked? But they, in rejoining the army, you indicated the matter was accomplished with great silence. And as I do not understand the reason for this fact, I would desire you to clarify it for me. Fabrizio said, When coming to battle there have been various opinions held by the ancient captains, whether they ought either to accelerate the step of the soldiers by sounds, or have them go slowly in silence. This last matter serves to keep the ranks firmer, and have them understand the commands of the captain better. The first serves to encourage the men more. And, as I believe consideration ought to be given to both of these methods, I made the former move with sound, and the latter in silence. And it does not seem to me that, in any case, the sounds are planned to be continuous, for they would impede the commands, which is a pernicious thing. Nor is it reasonable that the Romans, after the first assault, should follow with such sounds, for it is frequently seen in their histories that the soldiers who were fleeing were stopped by the words and advice of the captains, and changed the orders in various ways by his command, which would not have occurred if the sounds had overcome his voice. 